Okay, welcome everybody. Kitzur Shachonarach, the abridged code of Jewish law. We are doing chapter 23, but before we do, since Purim is coming up, it's the last uh, halacha class for Purim, just going to do a few quick uh, reminders. Last year we learned it in the Kitzur Shachonarach, but uh, just uh, refresh our memories. We don't always remember every detail from year to year, and uh, even things we do know. The worst thing is after it happened or was meant to happen and you realize that it didn't happen, and you go, oh, I knew that. All right, so it's it's really good to remind ourselves first. So first, first of all, this year is unusual because uh, Purim is a Sunday. So I guess we won't be having class next Sunday. Everyone's going to be very busy with uh, Purim festivities, God willing. I'm sure those in Florida, Robert Smith, has something outstanding planned. So it should be very exciting. But because Purim is on a Sunday, we know normally we fast the day before Purim, the fast of Esther. But uh, the fast of Esther doesn't happen on a Shabbos. Can't happen on a Shabbos. There are certain fasts. You can keep an overall Shabbos. Uh, the tenth of the tenth of Tavis in theory does in our calendar. Our calendar doesn't fall out on Shabbos, but in theory it would. But other fasts don't. So we're not fasting on Shabbos. So we're going to have to bring it forward. Once we're bringing it forward, we're not going to fast on Friday either because that would ruin our Shabbos. You know, try uh, uh, davening nicely Friday night and making Kiddush when, when you're fasting all day. So we bring it forward to Thursday. So Thursday uh, is the fast of Esther uh, this year. Um, so it's going to be start at sunrise and that'll wherever you are, different times, and the end when it gets dark. <clears throat> and then we're going to have a difference because the, the at Mincha on other fast day, other fast days, we say the longer Vidim Malkano and, and various things. And we don't normally do that on the fast of Esther because the afternoon before a festival is already semi-joyous. So we leave out the Tachnun, we leave out the long Vidim Malkano prayer, because it's going to be Purim. But this year, it's not Purim after the fast of Esther. So we're going to say these things on the fast of Esther, which we don't normally say. It's only every few years uh, that, that we say it. So we're going to say a long bit of volcano, um, and various things like on a regular, like a regular fast day. So that's that's a little unusual. Yes, David. There was an article in last week's Jewish Press. I didn't get a chance to read it, but it was the it told the title was "Are you supposed to be sad on the time of Esther?" Because all the other fasts, and, you know, you know, there's this element of sadness because it has to do with the destruction of the of the base of Mikdash. So this fast is leading up into Purim. So is there an element of sad? I, I didn't read the article yet, but is there an element of sadness related to time of Esther? Uh, not really. So this one is not to do with the destruction. As a matter of fact, it's it's almost a celebration. Because why do they we we fast because they fasted. Why did they fast? They fasted before they went into war, or as they went into war, because uh, it shows that Hashem listens to us. Hashem cares about us. And Hashem listens to to us when we we do we do tshuva and we when we cry out to Hashem. So although it's uh, every fast day has a degree of seriousness to it. But not sadness. It's because this is this is when Hashem. It's a sign that Hashem listens to us. So it's actually something to be happy about. So that's uh, that's. So the fast of Esther is unusual this year. It's forward, and uh, um, the diving is a little bit different. Let's just quickly go over the four mitzvahs of Purim. So, of course, we have the mitzvah of Purim is to, uh, the most famous one, of course, is the Megillah. So we have a mitzvah to read the Megillah. Well, interestingly, men have the mitzvah to read the Megillah, and women have a mitzvah to hear the Megillah, right? both by night and by day. Now, even the majority of men perhaps don't read the Megillah themselves, but they fulfill the mitzvah by hearing it. Um, and uh, just like one person can make Kiddush for multiple people. So you 
you do your saying of Kiddush by listening to someone else saying Kiddush. Um, so most men are also doing by hearing it. So the practical difference really is the bracha, right? If if uh, if sometimes people can't make it to uh, shul for whatever reason to the Megillah, so some may come to the house to read for them. And uh, if they're reading for a man, well, ideally the person should say the bracha themselves if they can, but let's just say they can't say the bracha. So the man is going to say the bracha on reading the Megillah, and a lady says the bracha on hearing the Megillah. Practically, you can only, only hear if it's read, but, you know, that's... Another practical difference is uh, if someone who's deaf, God forbid, reads the Megillah. So, for the mitzvah of reading the Megillah, he fulfills the mitzvah. For sure, if he reads for himself. And ideally, it's better someone else reads for others, but after the fact, if he read for other men, he's done the mitzvah. But for the ladies, he didn't do the mitzvah because he can't hear. And the mitzvah is uh, is hearing. So that's uh, just some practical differences. But any time from nightfall till dawn, for the night time, I mean, I don't know how many public Megillah readings are going to be at 2 o'clock in the morning, but you never know. And uh, for the daytime, from uh, from the, from the su sunrise to sunset, um, but again, better in the morning if you can, but whenever you happen to hear it. Second mitzvah, I think I'm not listening on in particular order, is Matonis Lev Yonim, giving gifts to uh, to the to the needy. So, um, how much should one give? All right. So there's there's two opinions. <laughs> two opinions about how much to give. One opinion is a pruta, which is the smallest copper coin. <clears throat> it's a weight in copper, so it's going to go up and down, but probably 25 cents for sure, 50 cents. Um, copper's actually uh, got an expensive recently, but still, a pruta is a very small coin. Um, so that's... Uh, and the other opinion is enough to provide a meal with some bread, you know, like a sandwich. So let's say uh, five dollars. So um, ideally, she got like the strict opinion, and we should give at least two people, at least two people, uh, this five dollars. Now, what happens today is Baruch Hashem. It's not like it was in the past that um, people actually. Before we do this, who is entitled to it? Right? Who who does it get given to? So. Today, the way we define it is either someone who does not have steady income or enough steady income for their day-to-day -day expenses. Right? They're, not, they're not making it. That's one definition. And the second definition is if there's someone, they do have their day-to-day -day expenses, but they have some extra abnormal expenses. They can't... They can't um, manage with either it's medical expenses or um, weddings or whatever whatever it is so these people you can fill the myths of like giving to anyone in in those situations <clears throat> so that myth I, I have a question that's not related to purim uh after yeah you... well, I don't we're want... going to be a purim for a little bit so maybe ask your question all right uh okay suppose a uh a family has a baby, and the baby, uh, uh, there's something wrong with the baby. Uh, it's developing, and not, not. She's, she's, uh, he's very slow. It's a, a male baby. He's very slow. He's been diagnosed as, uh, with, uh, me uh, mental issues. He becomes wants to still have a bar mitzvah. He knows he's being raised in a Jewish house. He knows what a bar mitzvah is, but he's not able to do the half Torah. By himself, are there? Is there any leeway? Is there any? Yeah. So, so, so the haftarah is really irrelevant in the big scheme of things. I mean, in theory, some become a mitzvah without even knowing they're Jewish, right? So, the the definite the issue with someone is going to become a mitzvah is 
the real issue of bar mitzvah is when the person becomes responsible for their own Judaism, their own observance of Torah mitzvahs. And the ceremony is just a way of celebrating that. But the reality is a person comes to mitzvah, and we say that's when a person's 13. So this individual, if they are mentally capable enough to understand that, mm -hmm. then they become a mitzvah regardless. Now, sometimes, sometimes, you know, I was uh, another, uh, well, he's actually older than me. I haven't seen him in many years, but he had his bar mitzvah at 15. Not why, because it took him a little bit longer to realize there's a thing of mitzvahs and there's consequences and there's uh so um that's that's well, there's a leeway the there's, there's a, a, a there can be an exception as far as the age yeah. so the age is not so much the issue the, it's it's really so we say someone with regular development at 13 years old has a certain understanding that there's consequences positive and negative of your actions and you can take a certain level of responsibility for your own actions a 13 year old is always not the same as an 18 year old Right. right, you don't let thirteen-year-olds vote or drive, so it's not a total what we might call adult mindset. But there's a certain level there. So if a person is able to come to that level, then they become bar mitzvah, so to speak. Right, so they they have the responsibility. There will be certain people who will never um, develop that that level of competence. And so to a certain extent, they're exempt from the mitzvahs. Now, that doesn't mean you ignore them. You're still the same way with a child. You encourage them to be involved as much as possible. So these are just older children. In other words, if they don't have the mental respect. capacity to understand what it means, it's yeah. they're still Jewish. They're still responsible. Correct. They're still, they're still, they're still possible, Jewish. But and you get them involved a, as much as possible, like, right. like you do a, a five-year-old, for example. So it's going to depend on the individual because when we say that someone is, is developmentally delayed, there's, there's a huge range of what that means. Yeah. So it's going to depend on the, on the individual. Today I am a fountain pen. Thank you, Rabbi. So... so just some questions, halakhic issues in the time of because today we live in a electronic global age. Right? Um, a thing just came up, said my connection was unstable for a minute. Did you hear what I said? Did I break up or it was good? Okay. So we live in the electronic going? global age. So the story is like this. Uh, sometimes what we do is we we might, for example, in the Tonus of Yonim, it could be in my neighborhood, there isn't, there aren't people, or there's not many people who are in need. And so I might donate to an organization in Israel who is distributing the, they'll distribute the funds to the needy um, in Israel. And that's a great thing to do. We encourage it, by the way. But there's a few issues. Issue number one is they're going to distribute it in Israel, it may not be pouring for me. Right? If it's, I have to give Matanas of Yonim, I have to give these gifts to the poor on, on Purim, but because Israel is ahead, it may be given out before it's Purim for me. So it's still a good thing to do, but you, you want to try and give two gifts locally in your same time zone to at least so you fulfilled the mitzvah. And for extras, because we should try and give, even though the minimum requirement is to give to two, and, and it could be that's all we can do. But if we are giving more, uh, it's just, just uh, bear that in mind. What also happens is that sometimes someone donates on Purim for themselves. Let's say Purim afternoon, I might donate money to an organization in Israel. But this organization already distributed on Purim morning. So they 
they gave out the money, they borrowed it or whatever, and they gave it out before I gave my donation. I hope I'm not making it too complicated, explaining it in too complicated way. So they, the, the money was distributed on my behalf before I even donated. Now that works, providing providing that the one distributing, what he does is they take the money, let's say the loan they got to give it out for a morning events, and they say, um, this money is being given retroactively when we find out to the person who's going to hey he's going to donate in the future so we assign this money to them in advance so that what ends up happening is that when when even though the money was given out already when i give my donation which ends up being used to pay back the loan but it was if i already owned that money that was distributed so that's uh, that works, but the organization has to do that, has to make that stipulation. Um, another sometimes just the issue just to raise when we give to organizations is that it could be, let's say, uh, I give hundred dollars, let's say, to an organization. So that will and truly covers the gifts to two people. But that organization may pull all the money they get, give to a thousand people. And so maybe only 20 cents of my money went to each guy. So but that's okay. That works. It still works. As long as I gave to the organization enough for two people, then even if they pull it and give it out to multiple people, it's as if I gave a uh, significant, you know, proper gift to each person. So that's... Uh, that all works. Um, so again, Shalach uh, Matanis of Yonim is trying to do as much as possible. What's possible for some people is different to what's possible for other people. But according to our, our means, we should uh, uh, give as many as possible, um, as much as possible, to, and to as many people as possible. It's also a question, is, let's say a person has a, a large sum of money. So should they give it to one person a large gift and set them up, so to speak, or small gifts to multiple people. So it, it depends. So the idea is to make as many people as happy as possible. Because part of the, one of the reasons behind giving the, the Matanas of Yonim is not only supporting the poor person or con contributing towards supporting them, but you, you put a smile on their face. You make them happy for Purim. So it's going to depend if it means because you're giving out to a lot of people, you only give them, you know, uh, $5, let's say. So $5 is nice, but it might not put a smile on the face. But if you're able um, to give, let's say, $100 to multiple people, and uh, Shem should bless us all that we should be able to do that. Uh, but that certainly puts a smile on their face. So the idea is to give to as many people something that gives a, a smile on their face. Having said that, on Purim, we say anyone who stretches out their hand to receive, we should give. So most of us can't start giving $100 to every single person. Um, and uh, Does it have to be money? Can it be food? Oh, good question. Excellent question. The, Matanas of Yonim actually can be food. If it's re ready edible food, it can be food. Um, but it can't be clothing or uh, other other necessities. Um, it's better to give money than food because it could be the person has food in the pantry and has other pressing needs. You know, the electricity is going to get cut off, God forbid. You know, whatever it is, struggling with their bills. So it's far preferable to give cash if possible, but food can fulfill the mitzvah. Yeah. So we should try and give one minute double, try and give to two people something nice according to our means and as many other smaller things as we can. Yeah, double. Yeah, the mitzvahs are usually done in the daytime, but what if the poor person comes at, at nighttime? 
the night before and he says, I need money. You don't, you don't want to say it to me. You have to wait till tomorrow. Well, this, uh, this so two, I can do the mitzvahs. Well, two answers to that. If by giving it to him tonight, but don't spend it till tomorrow, I could actually give an advance on Purim. If you're not going to spend it until Purim, then that works. Um, so, but the, the, night before is, the night before is Purim. Yeah, no, the night before. So he might want it that night. So he knows he's got it in his hand, but he's going to go shopping or pay his bill in the morning. So then for sure you do the mitzvahs, mitzvah Thomas of Yon. If you give it to him in advance, if you know he's not going to spend it till Purim day, that works. If if he needs it that night to spend that night, um, well, that's gen that's general sadaka. It's not matanas of yonim. So matanas of yonim is going to need to be by the day, but uh, the other sadaka. And with that, you know, we we have a mitzvah to give meisa, a tenth of our income, we should give to sadaka. It's called called meisa. So the question that's in general, across the board. So nothing to do with purim. So a tenth of what we what we earn uh, should go to uh should give the sadaka. <laughs> now um you can't use mice for Matanas of Yoni for the first two. In other words, the minimum two to give for the Matanas of Yoni has to be your regular money. Once you're given to two people, you want to give to more people, you can use mice. You can use your other sadaka funds. It's no problem. Or a person might have stock or box that they fill up. It's not for a certain purpose, and they might want to distribute it. So again, that's not from a tonus of yearning. A tonus of yearning has to come from your your money that you're going to use for yourself. But once you're given to the two people, and you want to give to extra people, or there's more people asking, then we can use my so we can use any other stock of money that we have. So that's... Uh, that's another question that we, probably most of us don't have, but there's at least one person here from in, joining us from Israel. And that is, we know that in Yushalayim and Jerusalem, they Purim the next day, right? So walled cities celebrate Purim on, on the 15th of Adar, and the rest of the world has Purim on the 14th of Adar. So if you live in one place, can you do Shalch Monas by giving to someone, sorry, Matanas of Yonim, the gifts to the poor, on the other day? So I'm in Jerusalem. Well, I'm not, I'm in Phoenix, but God willing, we will be. Shiach will be here. We'll all be in Jerusalem. But if I if I was in Jerusalem on the 15th of Shushan, 15th of Adar, so I'm keeping Shushan Purim the next day, what if I give to another Jew who lives outside of Jerusalem and for him, Purim is the day before, and I give it to him in his Purim. Or vice versa. Does that work? So, uh, the answer actually is not clear. Ideally, though, to avoid any, any, you know, to make sure that we do fill the mitzvah, you should really give your matonis of yonim on the day that you read the Megillah. So, your actual Purim. So, if you live in Jerusalem... It's going to be on Monday this year. Out, outside of Jerusalem, Sunday. So you should give your Matanas of Yonim on the um, day you read the, the Megillah. But again, once you're given to two people, you can give to more. So if you want to give more to someone, uh, on the, they have put them on a different day, that's no problem. As long as the main two uh, go to people on the day that you read the Megillah. Okay, any questions on the Matanas of Yonim or gifts to the needy? Well, so we just mentioned that the the Rambam, um, when he discusses all these laws, he emphasizes that it's much better to give extra than the needy and to fancy a priest for yourself. To have a fancier, uh, you know, give up more shalach to your friends, food baskets to your friends. This is the most important part because the one who makes the needy and the, the widows and the orphans and, and general needy uh, rejoice, that gives Hashem the greatest happiness. 
So it's more time to be on Shalch Manus. So we give out food gifts to our friends. So the food gifts we have to give to at least one person, two foods. So although there is a custom to have two different blessings, the two foods should have two different blessings. That's a custom. It's not a requirement. The main things have to have a different taste, different taste. So, um, you know, two apples doesn't count as two foods, even though it's two because it's the same taste. It's like you're you're just giving a bigger portion of of the one food. But if someone gave, uh, I don't know, let's say some hamantaschen and, uh, and uh, I don't know, um, a steak. Okay, you don't have to give a steak, but, you know, this, that's, that's two different tastes. Happens to also be two different blessings. But, you know, let's say a, a, a steak and, uh, and, and chocolate. Hopefully part of chocolate if you're giving the steak. Right? But it's the uh, same blessing, but two very different tastes. So the requirement is to give two different um, foods of two different tastes. <clears throat> two portions of the same food doesn't help. So to give two slices of pizza um, is really only one food, even though it's two pieces, because it's two pieces of the same food. Um, it has to be ready to eat. So ideally, if it's something needs to be cooked, it should be cooked. Uh, if you give it early enough in the day, so let's say... Okay, let's just use steak as this example. So if you give steak, then that's ready to eat. Someone gave raw steak. Uh, if it's early enough in the day they could cook it, you could fulfill the myths with that. But if you give a cow with the intention that people should shecht it and get their own steak, you can't do that. That doesn't fulfill the obligation. It right? doesn't fulfill the obligation. It has to be somewhat ready to eat. So with that comes a whole discussion. Let's say, for example, you give canned food. So some cans have the ring. They can just pull it open. But other cans require uh, a can opener. And the, maybe the person doesn't have a can opener. So maybe it's not ready to eat food. So to avoid the problem, you could give a can opener in the in the gift. Right? That, uh, or, a, or a corkscrew, you know, if it's a, if it's a bottle of wine. <clears throat> but the idea is to give two foods to at least one person. And again, ideally... It should be something a little bit substantial that they could actually have at their Purim, their Purim feast. Um, once you've given to one person, and what you give to others doesn't have to meet all the requirements. So if it's more basic to others, if it's uh, perhaps not quite 100% ready to eat, you know, it's, it's not such a big deal, as long as you've done the mitzvah at least once. Now, leaving the gifts at someone's doorstep, which often happens, you know, especially, let's say, for an example, um, uh, I've got a few kids at home, so they want to give to their friends and they give to their teachers. So, you know, spend, let's say, an hour or so for an afternoon driving around delivering, and so is everybody else. So you might drop off at someone's house and uh, they went home. So ideally, you should notify this again. If you've done the mitzvah once, it's no problem. We're talking about now for actually to fulfill the mitzvah. If they don't know about it until after Purim, then you didn't do the mitzvah. So you at least want to make sure you give to at least one person in the hand so they know, so you've actually fulfilled the mitzvah. And more than that, more than that is a bonus. So if, if the after the initial one you leave at someone's doorstep, is no problem. Um any questions, Charlotte Monis? Yeah, David. What about the idea that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're saying to the person, um, like, like um, you, you wouldn't give it, like if I come to my friend's house, I wouldn't give the Shalach Monis to him. I would give it to his wife to say, give to your husband. Or something like so, that. So yeah, so there is a because it's all because it's called Mishalaichman, this means sending gifts food gifts. There is a custom to give it through a messenger. Okay, it's it's not an absolute requirement. You can give to the person directly. Um but if you're able to, it's good to give through a messenger. So maybe uh um 
you come with your kids or grandkids and they hand it over or well, that person has kids or grandkids one around you know it's a gift to the kids and so it's uh, or to whoever you know you got a few well, friends would, in shul you well, give to one person to you give to him you give to him to give to him yeah. when well, i would Sorry? come to the person's house if i would come to the person's house if my friend answers the door i would say give this to your wife from my wife <laughs> Yes, that you can do that because because women shall only give to women shall only give to men because uh, again the one of the whole points of this is to promote friendship and and uh, closeness and uh, so therefore you know we we're not trying to become too close friends with our friends' wives and vice versa and different things so uh, obviously everyone wants to be friendly on good terms but we we want to you know I'll say there's a limit on the friendship. So want to give gifts to other people's wives and everything. So, but so men give to men, women give to women. But the case of David says that he'll give to his, it's from his wife, and he gives to the husband. Says this is for, to your wife from my wife. You know that that works. That works. Okay, I I actually forgot to mention something from before, but we'll come back to unless you have a question, Michelle Hamonis. Susan, you have a question? Okay, uh, I, I'm a little confused. Uh, okay, I'm uh, children. When, when children are uh, come to the door, is that still a mitzvah that you've given the children to, and the kids have to give it to their parents? Is that have I fulfilled well, the mitzvah? With well, another yes. So let's say, for example, so um, let's say a family comes. Just use a simple example. Family comes, and uh, they. Oh, whether they're bringing you and you give one back or you initiated to give them, it doesn't make a big difference. But if you gave to the kids and said, you know, this is for your family or this is to your parents, then that works. I actually, I'll take that back. When you say this is for your family, you should try and avoid that. Because when you say it's for the family, then there needs to be enough food to be significant for every member of the family. Right? And in which case it's going to be, it could, depending on the family... So if you would say to Rabbi Smith, for example, is your family, and Baruch Hashem, Blein Hara, he has a large family. So the Yefta has to be pretty pretty fancy, significant Shalach Modest. If you just give to him, or just give to his wife, or to one of the kids, then then it's uh, it's you know, it's two just for one person. Fair. I mean, obviously, you're not going to just give to the parents if they have a lot of kids. You're going to include yeah, them. Now, yeah, you know, I mean, most obviously. families have it's going to happen. They're all going to enjoy it together, whatever they get. Right. But but to technically fulfill the mitzvah, you're, you're trying to give two... Uh, when I say significant, you know, it doesn't have to be $100, you know, uh, restaurant, you know, whatever, but something significant, you know, look at somebody could eat at a meal per person. So when you give to one person, that's a certain amount. Give to a family of uh, 12, 13, 14, whatever it happens to be. It's a, uh, if there's enough for every person, then it, then it's, it's, if, it's, it's, it's a different size it, gift. If you send it through a company, if you send a fruit basket. Yeah. With your, a card that has your name, this is for your family. That's also acceptable. Yeah, so again, I'll, I'll, before I answer the question directly, I'll just emphasize one point again. Once you fulfill the mitzvah once, so you gave to one person the way it should be, others don't have to meet all the requirements. So when I when, so when I say it would have to be significantly for the whole family, well, that's if that's the one shalach monas you gave. If you happen to give to someone else already, and then you give to a family and it's less than a too significant foods for the whole family is no problem because it you're doing extra and so the main thing is to have one that's really halakhically perfect and you do that for one person and after that after that then the main idea is again increasing friendship and 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 sense of family between the jewish people so in that respect in that respect um although we do have a responsibility to society to give tzedakah sometimes to general, I mean, the wider world, not just the Jewish community. 
although we have a great responsibility to the Jewish community first. You like you meant to if you have a choice of doctor, you give your family first. And your family doesn't need the next responsibility is to your neighbors, right? Your neighborhood. And then so we et cetera. In other words, the one who you are closest with, that's who your greater responsibility is to. So we all have a responsibility to the Jewish community for the wider community. But there are many things that's appropriate. You know, sometimes you have to see certain organizations, the wider community that run the funds, maybe they it's churches and different, you know, it can be a little problematic. But so with that into specifics, is generally speaking, we should give um to the wider community at times as 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 well. You know, um um you know, growing up there was a a, a place near us that was um it was for people who to help people who were missing limbs. God forbid, not for such things or amputations or they never had. And it was uh, you know rehabilitation. It was teaching how to to do things with other limbs. And so one of the things they used to have is they used to, as a fundraiser they used to sell these uh, cards. You know there was nothing written inside it, but you could use the birthday card or whatever card, and it was. The, the front was painted by people either with their feet or their mouth or or something. And um, so every year when they had the thing, my mother used to buy a whole thing of them. And that used to be whenever we gave out birthday cards or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever happened to be, we always used these cards. So that's an idea. You know, I don't know if there were any Jewish people in that current place or not. Don't know. But that's the kind of thing we we help general society. So although we need to do that, but Matanas of Yonim, the gifts to the poor, and Shalch Monas, these food gifts, is to the Jewish people, specifically to that mitzvah. On Purim, you can also give charity to a non-Jew if you want, but that's not the mitzvah Matanas of Yonim, because as well as being Sadaka, the idea behind these mitzvahs is to increase the the friendship and the sense of family amongst the Jewish people. And so therefore, specifically to an, to, a, to another Jewish person. <coughs> yeah, David. Yeah, um, uh, just to build on what Susan was say, uh, asking, she was uh, talking about a child that comes to the door. So yeah. if you give to a child, does that fulfill your mitzvah because it's a minor? Yes, you can give to a child. And you can also give to the child to be the shliach for the family as well, for the parents, if you want. So you can fill the child. Now, when we say child, it's like this, though. Um. We just got back to Matanas of Yonim, for example, for the for the gifts, the monetary gifts to the poor. To give to a parents and a child, or husband and a wife, that's considered only one gift, or gift to one person, because they're one unit financially. So when so when we say you have to give to two poor people, um, you know, husband and wife doesn't count as two if the if you know, which is usually the case, you know, that the one financial unit um so that's only one so for the food gifts you only have to give to one person you have two foods but to one person so uh you know there it doesn't matter if it's you can give to the child you can give to the child for the parents you can give to the child and the parents it's all uh all works just one thing i forgot to mention before is the custom of of uh Giving on on the fast of Esther, giving um, uh, we usually call it Max's shekel, but we really got to avoid calling it that, right? So, it, at this time of year, they would give the half shekel uh, coin to the base of Mikdosh, and that's what all the offerings were for. So, there's a custom that we um, we give three half coins of whatever currency you have. So here, the half dollar coin, uh, three of them, because the the truma, when it mentions the giving to the... To, in the section of the Torah where it speaks about giving the half shekel, it calls it a truma, a certain type of donation. And it's mentioned, th the word truma is mentioned three times in that passage. So we, uh, we give that for each member of the household. Um... So that's uh, again. It's not an absolute obligation, but it's uh, it is a custom. But it's a custom that's brought 
in Shulchan Aruch. So once once a custom is brought in Shulchan Aruch, it's it's almost like a halacha. It's a very important thing to do. So if you're able to do that, um, okay. Any other questions or shalach monas before we move on to the next mitzvah? Okay. So sending. So, so we we'll asked before about sending fruit baskets or sending baskets from an organization. So there are many many organizations that um, uh, you donate or you give them money. Either it's a not profit or it's for charity, or even people do it for profit. Their business, um, you pay them and they deliver. So you can that that works. First of all, they that, that ends up being the shliach, the one who delivers. Um, and it doesn't matter that you paid before Purim. That's fine, as long as they deliver on Purim. But again, that's for the one you have to do the mitzvah. <clears throat> if besides the one you do the mitzvah, someone got came by delivery or the, it was the post office organization and it came a day before Purim, a day after Purim, it's not the uh, not the end of the world. There, there is an organization, there are organizations nowadays that they, you pay them, and instead of doing Shalach Monas, they give a card and say, you know, along the lines of, this person has honored you by giving a donation to this organization in your merit in lieu of a Shalach Monas. And um, it's a nice idea, and it's definitely, uh, particularly the many places where it's just wasteful the amount of shalach monas that's given out and it's a beautiful thing to do instead and you can do that but you still have to give your at least one shalach monas uh, you have to fill the mitzvah of giving two foods to one person once you've done that you know if you want to give sadak and someone's merit instead of giving them a food basket that that's certainly fine certainly fine but it's uh um you still have to do the mitzvah. It's not. It's not instead of shalach monas. It's uh, in addition. Okay. Then we have the uh, the Purim feast, the fourth uh, fourth mitzvah. Right. So the Purim feast should be during the day. There is a custom to eat a little extra at at night, um, but the main idea of the Purim feast is is during the day. Yes, sir. Yeah, just regarding shalach manas, um, some people think that they're giving shalach manas by like the the, the shul sends this uh, thing around and says, uh, you know, you can contribute to shalach manas. You can write down the name of the families that you want, and they notify them, and uh, they put their name on a list, and um, they let them know, like like in other words, you know what I'm talking about. They they give out a card on okay, so on it ends food. up being sadaka instead of the food package. Yeah. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So yes, that's what I was saying. So um that's a nice thing to do, but it doesn't fulfill your mitzvah of Shalch Monas. So you have to at least give to one person. Because a lot of people mistakenly think that it does because yeah. they call it Shalach Monas. Yeah. So if you want to do that, once you've done the mitzvah, if you want to do that for people rather than just more nash and more nash and people getting all these things in the house a few weeks or Pesach that they really don't, they and the waistlines don't need, you know, it's, uh, that you know, that's fine. But at least we have to do the basic mitzvah of going to at least one person. So the Purim feast is on the day of Purim. Uh, and we'll also, so we should wash for bread and uh, and, and have a nice meal. There's a mitzvah to drink wine also at that mitzvah, those who are able to handle wine. And, um, you know, there's a mitzvah, Adela Yada. So on a simple reading, a simple reading of the Talmud, it seems to say that one should drink enough wine or other drink until they're so drunk, they can't tell the difference between blessed is Mordechai and cursed is Haman. Now, um, right after that, it brings a story of someone of two Talmudic sages who did drink too much and one killed the other. He happened to be able to resurrect him the next day, or right after, I should say. But when he invited him the next year, he said, I'm not coming back. <laughs> Had a miracle once, not relying on it again. And most 
uh, commentators say that this story is brought to refute the simple reading that you're not really meant to get that drunk. So the Ramah in, in Shulchan Aruch, he rules that a person should drink just a little bit extra. And when a person gets uh, drinks a little bit extra, they get tired and you have a little nap. And while you're napping, you don't know the difference between blessed is Mordechai and cursed is Haman. Right? And and he says you fill the missile like that. Now throughout history there have been people who have uh who have drank on Purim, but we have to remember like this. You know, how much to drink, people have to drink responsibly. How much the how much that is is different for different people. Some people have one sip and that's that's already enough for them. Some people can drink more and it has less effect, depends on the metabolism and, and, and who they are. But two things yes. Yeah, isn't it, are we supposed to have more food than wine? Oh, than definitely, <clears throat> definitely, but, is, but you know, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I'll just come back to one. I just want to finish this point that the point is, is we're definitely not meant to be driving the Lung Shalach Manas when we're under the influence when we're going to be dangerous to someone else. That's definitely not what the sages had in mind when they told us to uh, to have some Lachayim on Purim. And also, if it means that we're not going to bench after the meal properly, we're not going to be able to dive mara properly, uh, if we're going to start behaving antisocial or or not or, or silly, um, that's also not what they had in mind. That's that's not the purpose. It's not the purpose. The purpose is to is to have some lachaim and bring extra joy, not to not to you know, be a drunkard and start vomiting and passing out. And unfortunately, every year you have some young people who, you know, Baruch Hashem, generally speaking, generally speaking, uh, most Yeshiva Baruch Hashem don't drink that much. And the Purim one year, they, you know, the one day of the year, they drink more than extra and they're not used to drinking. And every year, unfortunately, people end up in hospital and different things, they get carried away. So we have to bear in mind that, yes, um, there's a mitzvah have a little extra, but it has to be done in a way that's safe, uh, responsibly, and uh, does not affect any other mitzvahs that we need to do. Yeah, sorry, Moshe. I'll just come back to your question. Sorry. Um, no, that that's basically I was just mentioning. I was I heard that it's more food than than iron. You know, it's not supposed to be the opposite. Yeah, there is a view, it's particularly wine. You know, the the this view can be any drink, and there's plenty of communities that drink whatever the local drink of their place was. Um, but, uh, you know, also, I think a person keeps it to wine, it has uh, less of effect, less of an effect, um, less of a negative effect, we should say, than if people are drinking all kinds of things and mixing drinks and, and different things. All right. Any other questions on Purim? All right, well, that was the four misses nutshell. So I guess we'll, and this is our questions on Purim, we'll get straight back to where we're up to in the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. Okay, so we're chapter 23. And we're up to number three. Yeah. So Simon Hof Gimel, chapter 23, uh, Sif Gimel, you know, uh, paragraph number three. So we've taken out the Torah from the Ark, and we're going to, to read the Torah. So the Torah, so you open the Torah, and you've got to look at the place that you're going to read. So what happens is in many shuls, um, when the person gets called out before he makes the blessings, they show the person the beginning and sometimes depending on what type of shul, which shul you're in, also the end of the piece is going to be read now that you're being called out. So the person actually sees the whole piece that's going to be read that they're saying the blessing on. Okay, so once he sees the place is going to be read, and then he holds it with two hands, now, open. Now, there are many communities that actually close the Torah when they make the blessing. 
but his custom he's in the part of the world where the custom is to make blessing with the Torah open to what you're actually going to be reading. So uh in the Chabad generally they you know they make it with the Torah closed. The Saga Ainov and he closes his eyes and he says, and not just uh in in theory it's good to close your eyes and concentrate totally, but many people need to read the blessings. So uh, and usually the blessings are on the bimmer there next to you or something. So if you need to read it, you're certainly allowed to have your eyes open, right, to read what you're saying. Um, but if you're not by heart, it's it's uh, comfortably, then it's a nice thing to have your eyes closed to concentrate. The ayim, and then you say, Baruch es Hashem Mavoyrach, which means let us bless, uh, you know, Hashem's name should be blessed. Yesh loyma bakol. And you should say it loud enough that everyone can hear. And then they can answer. Baruch Hashem Mavarech Loilam Void. Right? Blesses, blessed Hashem, be blessed forever and ever. Now, the Imlo Shamot Sibel Esam Mavarech. If the congregation can't hear the person saying the blessings, you didn't say it loud enough, or it's a very big shul. Even though you you hear the other people answering, well, in this case, he particularly uses the person reading the Torah answering. You don't answer with them if you didn't hear. Rather, after the leader of the congregation answers, you say Amen to what he said. Right, because you can't really answer to something you didn't hear. So the situation would be like this. The person got his aliyah, got called up to Torah, he says, Baruch Hashem Mavoyrach, and you didn't hear him. But the person reading the Torah standing next to him says in a big, loud voice, Baruch Hashem Mavoyrach, so you can't say that with him because he didn't hear. He, he's responding to what he heard, but you can't respond if you didn't hear. So rather say Amen after that second statement. And after the congregation is answered, when the person said it loud enough that everyone could hear, so they all responded. So the one who is saying the blessing, he repeats it again after them. And then he makes the blessing that Hashem chose us to give us the Torah. For Oynim Hakal Amen, and the congregation says Amen to his blessing. Yeah, now, while he was making the blessing, he was holding the Torah with two hands. So, Masalakis Yada is small. This now removes his left hand. And he's only holding uh, the Torah now with his right hand because it's got two. Legs, the handle, so to speak. So he was holding the both. We made the blessing, and now he's only holding one on the right. Rabbi, and yeah, I, I mean, I've had situations in which they do not repeat the uh, before the before the actual bracha. They don't, somebody, you know, the you know, the the reader responds. They don't. Then the the one who's been called up doesn't read. Doesn't respond or doesn't repeat it. He just goes directly into the bracha. Yeah. So what what happens in a situation like that? <clears throat> so I think it depends. If you can say it to him quietly, and uh, he'll correct himself, so to speak, then I think that's good. I I don't think it's it's worth stopping him and making a big deal, and and, and the person's going to get embarrassed. Um, and realize they've gone back. Although you can say something to the person afterwards, you know, let them know afterwards. Um, yeah, so I think in general, I think all, all corrections should be done very quietly and discreetly at all times. Um, sometimes you point to point to it on the paper, that's enough for him to realize, oh, I meant to say this, and that'll work really well. And if not, he's already halfway through a bracha, let it go, and, and, and just explain to him afterwards. So then, the person reading now holds the right one, and now, 
sorry, the person of the blessing now holds the right leg for, for better lack of a better word. And uh, the person reading is going to hold the other side. The Kaira Kaira, and then the reader, he reads the Torah. The whole Kaira in my Balachash. And ideally, the person getting called up should read along very quietly. He just says quietly, I'm adding the very, and I'll explain why in a moment, with the reader. So what happened was originally, originally, everyone was expected to read the Torah themselves. So someone got called up, and uh, he would just get up, say the blessing, and read whatever section, without notice, uh, that he was called up to read. And it's probably at a point today where overall majority of people could, could not do that without preparation, without prior notice and preparing. But that's today. But it got to a point where a sizable minority could not do that. So they, what they started doing was they had a reader that would read for everyone. So it didn't embarrass the person who didn't know how to read. Not the one who, because you know, this person couldn't read, he had to have someone read it for him, it was very embarrassing. So to avoid that, they had a reader now read for everyone. But since ideally the person being called up should read it themselves, they should read along quietly with, with, with the reader. Now, again, not everyone can do that, but if you're able to, that's good. I add in the very quietly because I've seen many times that the person reading along reads uh, too loud, sometimes one word off the reader, and he messes up the reader. <laughs> he, like, the reader gets totally messed up because this guy next to him is uh, uh, just too loud. And usually the people who do that for some reason are always off key as well. I don't know where that happens, but you know, that's uh, so quietly. Now, the reader, he shouldn't start reading until the congregation has finished saying Amen, because we don't want anyone to miss out on hearing anything. And all the congregation should be paying careful attention and listening well. Now, after they read that section, now the one who got called up again holds with both hands. The guy and he, he rolls it closed. And he says the another blessing that's the concluding blessing uh, on the Torah. So that's uh, that's that. So we um, any questions? Okay, so I wish everyone a wonderful week. She have an easy, fa easy fast of Esther, those who can fast. Thank and you, uh, I, since I won't see you beforehand, well, hopefully we will, Mashiach, come with everyone, but possibly won't. We'll wish everyone a wonderful Shabbos and a joyous and uplifting, incredibly inspiring Purim. Thank you, Rabbi. 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 Stay safe. Thank you, Rabbi. Happy, happy Purim, everybody. Thank you very much, happy Rabbi. Purim, Rabbi. Well, happy take Purim. care. Happy Purim. I can